Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi, and today we're having a look at an object that, for longtime viewers of the channel, might seem rather familiar. So if you'll recall, quite a few episodes ago, I covered the history of simplex typewriters, which are a type of crude indexing typewriter originally intended as a low-cost alternative to actual typewriters, but later mainly sold as children's toys. Well, the other day I was in an antique store and I came across this variation on that theme from a rival company. This is a dial type manufactured by the Lewis Marks Company of New York City sometime in the 1940s or the 1950s. And something that immediately struck me about this is how overly complicated and convoluted this is compared to a simplex. So if we look at a simplex typewriter, you'll see that the selection dial and the ring of little letter presses rotate around the same axis. And the whole assembly is simply hinged, so you just need to push down on it in order to print a letter on the page. By contrast, if we look at the Marx dial type, we'll see that while the selection dial is still horizontal, the letter press wheel is vertical, the two being linked by a gear system. Also, that whole assembly is mounted on this complex pivoting mechanism that is operated by pressing this key at the end. And then here on the letter wheel, you'll see this U-shaped piece of metal uh, that ordinarily would have held a felt pad full of ink. And when we depress the print head, it hinges out of the way, and that ensures that the letter is inked immediately before it prints a letter. Now, just like the simplex, there is a ratchet mechanism that advances the carriage one letter at a time. Uh, this one is pretty rusty and not well oiled, so it doesn't really work all that well. And in addition, we have a space key on the side, which has a parallel ratchet mechanism that also advances the carriage, but without lowering the print head. So as you can see, it's a considerably more complicated and convoluted way of achieving the same end goal. And when I first saw this, my immediate thought was, Aha, this is meant to get around a patent. So how this works is that a patent will typically not just protect your overall idea, but the details of its implementation, specific features and claims. So if you design a mechanism in a certain way or a process, and somebody else wants to make a product that does the exact same thing, they can't go about it in the same way as you've described in your patent, otherwise they will be infringing upon your patent. So for example, if the patent for the simplex typewriter specifies that the selection dial and the wheel containing the letter presses are coaxial and mounted in the same housing, well then if you want to make your own simple typewriter, you can't use that mechanism. And that's what Marks and Company have done here, where the selection dial is horizontal, but then the letter press wheel is vertical. And so that gets around that part of the patent. Similarly, if the simplex patent says that the entire print head assembly is simply hinged and you just need to press on the opposite side in order to print, well, if you're creating a competing typewriter, you can't do the same thing. You have to come up with this whole convoluted hinged mechanism in order to achieve the same effect. Now, of course, this is just speculation on my part based on my understanding of patent law, but as I continued to research this typewriter and the company that produced it, I discovered that this is probably exactly what happened. So Lewis Marks and Company was formed in 1919 in New York City, and for over 60 years, it was one of the most successful toy companies in the United States. In fact, it was one of the few American companies to actually grow during the Great Depression because they set up factories in depressed areas like Pennsylvania. Now, over the years, they were responsible for introducing a variety of classic toys, including Rock'em Sock'em Robots in 1964 and the Big Wheel Tricycle in 1969. But for the most part, their business model consisted of selling lower cost knockoffs of other people's products that were similar enough to remain competitive, but different enough to not violate copyright or infringe on patents. And this is exactly what happened with their extensive line of toy typewriters. They came out with a ton of different models, all with these weird and wonderful variations on the same basic mechanism in order to stay ahead of their competitors. And the vast majority of these typewriters were invented by a single person, Samuel Berger. If you go on Google Patents or the US Patent Office and you search his name, you'll see just a ton of patents 
with a whole bunch of wacky mechanisms for toy typewriters. So as far as avoiding patent infringement goes, this is a fairly innocuous example, but this sort of practice can have very serious consequences. And probably one of the best illustrations of this is the Winchester Model 11 shotgun. So in 1898, the legendary firearms designer John Moses Browning patented this. This is the Browning Auto 5, and this was the world's first commercially successful auto-loading shotgun. And up until this point, Browning had an arrangement with the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, wherein they would just buy up every patent he came up with, either to keep it off the market or to implement themselves. But Browning was so confident that the Auto 5 would be a world beater that he said, well, no, this time I want an actual royalty. And so Winchester rejected him, and Browning then went over to Belgium and FN and had them manufacture his shotgun. And this ended up being a decision that Winchester very much regretted, because as Browning had predicted, the Auto 5 was extremely popular and would set the standard for auto-loading shotguns until after the Second World War. But Winchester, being an arms company, wanted in on that market. And so they started looking at ways that they could produce a shotgun that performed about the same as the Auto 5, but didn't infringe on Browning's patents. And this proved remarkably difficult, and it took them over 10 years to come up with a workable design. And one of the workarounds they came up with had to do with the bolt handle. Now, this is a long recoil shotgun, which means that the entire barrel ah, moves rearward. And when you pull on the bolt handle, this disconnects the bolt from the barrel. And what Winchester realized is that if they remove that handle, they could get around the patent. So then how did you load the shotgun? Well, what you were supposed to do is just pull the barrel back on your own. And they actually put knurling on the barrel to make it easier to grip. And they finally released this in 1911 as the Winchester Model 11 shotgun. Unfortunately, they realized that they had worked in quite a severe design flaw. Now, when you were reloading the shotgun, you were supposed to hold the shotgun safely, point it away from you, and cock it as so. But what a lot of people were doing was placing the butt on the ground and pushing down on the barrel with the muzzle right below their heads. And shotgun shells at the time were made out of paper and they could swell and get stuck inside the barrel. And if this happened, and you push down with enough force to ram the primer against the firing pin, you could blow your head off, and quite a few people did, and people do who have these shotguns to this very day. And that earned the shotgun the nickname of the Widowmaker. So I suppose the lesson here is that although getting around patent restrictions is an ordinary part of innovation and business competition, there are certain cases where you're really better off admitting that you've been licked. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. I thought this was just a neat item in and of itself as an example of the history of typewriters and toys, but also as a unique window into a quirk of patent law that has led to a lot of really interesting designs in all fields over the years. So I hope you enjoyed that. Anyway, I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where I'll have a look at yet more typewriters and guns and all sorts of other devices. But until then, I'm Jules Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.